Okay, uh, we're going to, Michael and I are going to pass the ball back and forth a few times. Um, I'm going to go through um, a number of items here, uh, aggregate strategic outlook, a brief look at kind of where we are in the U.S. and in Texas uh, related to demand and production of uh, aggregates, and then looking a little bit about how we find good rock so we can meet the AQMP that uh, Michael's going to go over. Brief look through quarry operations, and then uh, if we have time, a little bit more on quality consistency and, and where our priorities are in uh, manufacturing of stone for Texas. Um, strategic outlook. This is some slides put together by our uh, corporate uh, marketing group in Birmingham. Uh, this shows the total stone, which is on the bottom, and total sand and gravel uh, on top uh, from 1969 to uh, 2015, which is the most current data from the USGS. You can see the Great Recession, how much aggregate production in the U.S. dropped, 37%. Uh, you know, it was pretty significant. Many uh, stone manufacturers, including Vulcan, laid off many people through the recession because our uh, many quarries literally were not even operating. Some uh, in some parts of the country, three out of four would not even be operating. Uh, that's improved somewhat. Uh, next is uh, just showing the difference in sand and gravel versus stone production. From 1970, it was about a 50-50 split. Uh, nation, and again, this is nationwide, 49% uh, stone, 51% sand and gravel. 2015, it's almost 60-40. Probably now it is 60% stone, 40% sand and gravel. So it shows you the uh, in, in many places where sand and gravel is being consumed, and uh, stone is is now predominant. This is a slide showing uh, the basis of 1975 is one. The blue line is population growth, and the green lines are um, production of aggregates. On the left is Texas, on the right in the entire U.S. You can see, of course, Texas population is outgrowing the average of the U.S. And you can see the dip in uh, production of stone. And you can see we, in Texas, we've already reached above where we were prior to the uh, recession, whereas the U.S. is, is really, on a nationwide level, has really just gotten back to uh, equal amount of growth as population. So, uh, and then on the bottom, that's just showing 40-year, 30-year, 20-year, and 10-year uh, average uh, between Texas uh, population and aggregates in the U.S. So Texas is definitely outpacing the rest of the country. This is showing uh, Texas aggregate production related to the total U.S. Back in 1970, we were about 5% of the total U.S. production. Now we're 11% probably 12 in 2016 as we continue to grow. And this is the same just in demand where we are um, outpacing uh, the U.S. You know, we're, we're at 11% of the total U.S. production. Uh, this slide is showing, uh, this is from uh, Moody Analytics showing population, household, and employment uh, growth ranked by the top 10 states. Uh, Texas, Florida, and California kind of share the top three. You can see we're showing Texas's potential. This is 2015 to 2025 um, up there, showing 18% population growth, 13% household growth, and 12% employment growth. So uh, Texas is definitely having a uh, you know, significant amount of growth. And uh, with our Prop 7 money coming, uh, hopefully, uh, about this time next year, there'll be additional demand and uh, more text dot uh, demand for stone. So where does the aggregate industry get this coming growth? Uh, there's two ways to get it is expanding existing quarries. This is the Chico area with the big Hanson and Mark Marietta quarries. They have uh, lots of room to expand there, so that, that will continue. Uh, here's a quarry in San Antonio. You can see right in the middle, this is our Hebner quarry. You can see around it, there's not a lot of expandability here with uh, uh, one thing about quarries, it attracts 
new subdivisions and schools. I don't know what it is about schools, but they love to put in a school right next to a quarry. Um, so in Texas, we have two extremes. The, you know, it's called the fall line. This runs from uh, all the way out past Del Rio, all the way through to uh, almost to lower New York, uh, where we have the coastal plains below it and then much more stone structure above it. Uh, Michael could get into that as the geologist, but south of the fall line, there's very little stone. There is some, but most of our stone sources are north of that. That's also the escarpment of the Edwards Formation, you know, coming through San Antonio, New Braunfels, where many of the quarries are that uh, feed Central Texas and Houston. So what's above the fall line? It's crushed stone, below it, sand and gravel and uh, not a lot of gravel in some places anymore. This is from the USGS, and uh, Michael, all the dots on here doesn't mean these are AQMP approved sources. This is every mine that, that the USGS has on record. And you can see in green it's stone, and in the uh, yellow is sand and gravel. There are some stone sources south of the uh, fall line uh, it's a much younger geologic structure. In a lot of the cases, those stones are uh, weak. It's a caliche up in north uh, east Texas. Some of these are still pretty good stone, but by and large, it's above that uh, fall line. So what rock types are we looking for? Of course, the limestone and dolomites are class B, and uh, Michael will go into that a little bit later and then our igneous materials uh, granites basalts and rhyolites are, are more rare in the in the state that's class a and then under sedimentary is the sandstone which qual qualifies as a class a because it ha if it has enough acid insolubility and enough uh, soundness which uh, michael go over that uh, as well metamorphics we have uh, very little around. I don't, I'm not sure if there's any metamorphic even being mined as construction material. So if we're looking for new materials, the geologists uh, do their job. They start sniffing around for rock. Uh, they know where the uh, members are. They know where the stone sources are by using a lot of uh, U.S. Ge geological mapping. Um, here's an example of the San Antonio area. Uh, they know where the good materials are, the good stones are. Um, geologists do a lot of homework looking. Then if you find a piece of property that uh, is large enough and has uh, what is potentially uh, good stone, uh, you come out and drill it. Uh, coring is not cheap. It runs 25 to 50 bucks a foot, a linear foot, uh, and, and we may drill 20, 30, 50 holes, 200 feet deep, you can add that up at $50 a, a foot. Uh, you can spend quarter million dollars drilling a piece of property and then find out it's not even uh, good enough to use. Uh, then the uh, geologist or the rock lickers come up, no offense, uh, Michael. Uh, we had a, had a meeting years ago on one of the quarries where four or five of us standing around looking at a big face and uh, uh, one of the guys was a, a PhD geologist and one of the guys leaned over to me and said you watch before we leave this place he's going to be licking rocks you just wait and sure enough he's tasting rock so geologists have the typically in the nickname rock lickers we after we core it uh, we we have do a lot of evaluation there's a lot of time spent uh, uh, as the geologists go through classify you know what what rock members they have uh, we will then go through petrographic analysis, uh, chemical analysis, LA abrasion, all the properties that uh, are required, you know, to determine coat, ASR. It's becoming much more of an issue. The coat is, you know, fairly new. Um, and um, and, and as, as far as that goes, it's uh, difficult to determine because we can't test it. It has to go to tech stop before we even know what the coat numbers are. Freeze thaw is not required by TxDOT, but if you're uh, supplying to Corps of Engineers, FAA, or any federal project, sometimes freeze thaw is required. 
uh, and that's a very long and slow test, so uh, that's also needed. Then the geologists will start modeling, uh, determining uh, you know, where the good material is, uh, figuring out how to mine it, developing a mine plan. Uh, this is all prior to even um, permitting. And then we'll, then if, if everything's acceptable and you're ready to uh, open up a greenfield site, uh, the permitting process, as you know, can take months and months and even years. If you get into uh, the NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, problem with uh, claims and, and whatnot, it can take a year or two. Um, I know of a big quarry from a competitor of ours in California that spent $10, $15 million in about 15 years to open up a quarry outside of uh, San Diego. I'm not sure if it's been opened or not. Uh, aggregate production, um, Michael, you want to stop here and, and run through? Sure, if you want to finish up with that, we'll get Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and go through the, I've uh, got to cut some slides on aggregate production, then we'll have Michael um, do his. Um, plant automation, uh, the newer plants, the big plants are highly automated, uh, real-time data. Uh, it's really helpful for uh, operators. Uh, prevents uh, mistakes and accidents. Virtually everything on the plant is, this is a typical screen of one of the new plants. It has live amperage feed, uh, production rates, even uh, thermocouples and, uh, and uh, thermal cameras to determine heat points. Uh, everything's live. Uh, plant managers can even sign in at home and look at the production if, if they're running double shift. Uh, this is a secondary, a primary and secondary screen. Uh, this is a, a tertiary screen. It shows, uh, can even show size of uh, stockpile percentages. You can see the tonnage rates, uh, really useful, uh, helpful for the operations. Uh, all right, let's go through a little bit of, of aggregate actual production and what we go through. You know, stripping, blasting, hauling, crushing, screening, maybe dry or wet process, depending on your geology, depending on what we're trying to do, more crushing and screening than stockpiling. Some quarries have a lot of overburden. This, this is a uh, quarry actually in Tennessee, I believe, or it might be upper Alabama. It has 100 foot of dirt and, and a bad chert that has to get removed before it has uh, a large limestone uh, member. Drilling uh, is, you know, initially what's uh, done for blasting to uh, bust the rock up. Then we load it with AMFO, which is the, the traditional uh, nitri um, um, ammonium nitrate and diesel fuel. It's what was used in uh, the terrorist in Oklahoma City, you know, when he blew up the, uh, the Murr Federal Building. It's highly explosive once it's mixed. And then uh, blast the face. This is a high-level blast in a, a deep quarry. This I found on the internet. Looks like some crazy people blowing up something. I'm not sure what this blast was. Uh, highly uncontrolled. Uh, we have a, our big quarry in Mexico is underwater, so it's underwater blasting. You do not use AMFO for that. It has to be a plastics type. And let's see if this will work. Got a short clip. That's a quarry in um, Kentucky. That was about a 100,000 ton blast. Two benches, the bottom bl uh, bench is about 100 foot, and that second, uh, top bench is about 80 foot. Uh, really big, big blast. Uh, then, of course, we're hauling on into the uh, primary. Primaries are uh, typically, uh, typically they're one of these three, gyratory or cone which are similar uh, jaw crushers and v uh, VSIs, vertical shaft impactors. And that depends on, on your stone. If it's a class A or a siliceous type material, you would use the, uh, the compression, which are the top two. Uh, if it's limestone dolomites, we would be using uh, VSIs, uh, which are more efficient and, uh, and uh, higher production. 
in South Texas and many parts of the state, uh, we use scrubbers, it's, which would be used in a wet system. It's to remove those uh, clays and fines. As Dr. Little said, the smectite clays would be in some of our stone, and we obviously don't want that. So the scrubbers, uh, expensive and uh, high energy, usually they have a thousand horsepower or more turning those things, it's a big bathtub. The rock comes from your primary, which is usually six to 12 inch, and it literally just rolls through there underwater, uh, just grinding up uh, clay and particles and washing it out. Uh, then we start the process, secondary, tertiary, and quinary, crushing down, screening, more crushing, more screening, until we get to the sizes we're needing. Some of them are wet, some of them are dry, depending on uh, geology and, and where, where we are. Secondary and tertiary crushers, I'll explain a little bit about those. Our dolomites and limestones are typically used uh, the horizontal or vertical shaft. Uh, the HSIs, low operating cost, high production, but they create higher fines. They do create good cubicle rock, which you know we have to have. They're typically used for primary and secondary Again, not for siliceous rocks. Um, the other most common is the vertical shaft. Uh, it creates really good cubicle. They're often called the finisher. Uh, they can, they, you can actually use large uh, v VSIs for primaries and secondaries. Uh, they're also used as the finisher because you get uh, very cubicle. They can adjust the speed to uh, control how much uh, how much fines are created. They can have a high wear cost. Uh, if you get into the salacious hard materials, both of these impactors can cost a whole lot of money. A, a typical HSI set of blow bars cost about 40,000 and will last six to nine months. We had a quarry that got into a heavy zone of chert and we were going through blow bars in six days. And, you know, in that case, you would actually have to replace that, if that was continuing, you'd have to replace that impactor crusher with a uh, compression crusher. But then you get the flat and elongated particles uh, that become issues. Um, in tertiary crushing, typically the high-speed cones can be used as well. Um, high-speed cones do improve the uh, flat and elongated, although it is a compression crushing uh, machine so it does have a little higher uh, flat and elongated particle shape than the uh, two impactors. Here's kind of an example of the difference between impactors and uh, compression crushers. On the right you can see flat and elongated irregular shape. On the left, you know, very cubicle um, shape. Um, again, I've already mentioned the, the impactors create the cubicle nature. The disadvantage of them is they do create more fines and uh, are expensive to run if you get into the uh, salacious materials. A quick example, um, we did an R&D with the same material run through Im impactors versus compression crushers. And, it, and the, you can see the gradations are identical actually did a mixed design. This is the volumetrics of the aggregate between compression and impactor. The impactor had much low, lower voids. The compression had higher voids due to the flat and elongated. Mixed design was made identical, the same uh, products. Uh, here's the gradation. It was identical. And down on the bottom, you can see the AC content was the same, and yet the air voids were significantly different this came from uh, the compression crushing. It was flat and elongated. It creates VMA, but then that VMA can break down in, in rolling and in traffic. And you could actually then later have flushing on, an, on a hot mix. So that would be uh, very undesirable, and you would have to use impactor crushers to eliminate that. Screening and sizing, uh, of course, as I said earlier, a lot of the units are dry or wet, depending on where we are and if you have high clay contents. Uh, many of the plants in Texas have uh, big sand classifiers that can actually take those fines, classify it into uh, good usable sand, 
Uh, we make C33 concrete sand uh, where it's allowed. It's not allowed in type in class P because it's uh, has to have siliceous material for uh, surface traffic. And then in some plants, uh, we have water conservation units. Uh, they're water separators that actually pull the water out. You get highly uh, uh, reuse of your water, up to 95% reuse of your water in your systems and in your ponds so we don't have to pull water from wells. San Antonio, very expensive, uh, buying water from the Edwards Aquifer. Um, you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in uh, purchasing water. And then stockpiling for our customers, and I think I'll stop here. Michael. All right, uh, thank you, Harry. I wasn't expecting being called any names while I was up here, but um, <laughs> let's see. So as you can see, um, there's a lot that goes into making uh, aggregate on the industrial side. So TxDOT's responsibility and what we do um, is to check that quality of that material that's coming out from any of those sources. So uh, there's two there's the project level testing that's done, handled with the district, and then there's also what I'm going to talk about is going to be the AQMP. Um, this is roughly what I'm going to talk about, um, the purpose, the responsibilities, the products, and the labor laboratory test um, in detail, and then also how do we add a, uh, an a, a source to the AQMP. So first of all, what is the AQMP? Um, it is a, um, it's a program where we actually test rock and, and develop ratings for it. Um, and it's managed by the, um, the aggregates lab within the construction division. We monitor the aggregate products that are supplied to textile projects. And these are, the, these are the, uh, uh, the products that we're looking at. So one of the things you'll notice in here are the products that are not covered by the AQMP which is going to be riprap stone, gabion, uh, mattresses, uh, and uh, flexible base, as well as uh, MSC backfill. Uh, these are the tests that we're going to run um, for the durability test um, for the AQMP um, that are, you know, for those QMs that are actually running twice a year at least. Uh, so. And then we develop from that testing history, we're going to develop rated values so that for the concrete rated and the uh, bituminous rated source quality catalogs. And that's going to be published online and is also uploaded into uh, Site Manager. All right, the sources currently on the program are in Texas and the surrounding um, states and country. There are 97 sources on the bituminous rated source quality catalog. Say that five times fast. Um, there's also 168 on the catalog, uh, concrete catalog and 61 sources on both. And here's a map. Um, so if you compare his map to my map, um, you can see there's a lot of sources. These are, his sources have a lot more. Um, uh, we just, these are the ones that actually are on the AQMP and currently uh, supplying to textile projects. And that is one of the requirements for uh, Text 499A. Um, the purpose of the AQMP is to allow the districts to use the rated values uh, that the construction division tests um, and develops so that they do not have to perform any laboratory tests on the AQMP. It also expedites the aggregate or the acceptance of the aggregate meeting the specifications and it provides continuous quality assurance of aggregate products. So here's a little um, polling question. I don't know if we got this set up or not, but um, which district has the most sources listed in the AQMP? You probably want to know. Um, so if you guys want to chime in, I don't know if you guys are logged in or not, um, but this will happen. So the way this one will work is when you, if you want to put in, type in, you know, whatever the district is or the number, uh, or you can put SJT for San Angelo, 
or whatever. Um, but this is kind of how it works. And then the most responses will get bigger and bigger. So. I think we uh, got an answer of San Antonio. Well, we'll check that in a little bit. Uh, these are the three major players for the uh, for the AQMP. We got the construction division, the textile districts, and the aggregate producers. Uh, the responsibilities for the construction division are to you know to request those quality monitoring um, samples at least twice a year, uh, sometimes more depending on how close they are to the spec limits. Um, and then also we do the laboratory testing. We act as the uh, testing lab for the districts for these durability tests. And then we report those test results uh, to the districts and the agri producers, and we also maintain the, the catalogs. Um, and then any, if there's any kind of quality concerns, we also notify the districts and the agri producers and work through those concerns. Uh, so just a fun fact. Um, the Agris lab on average completes about 1,650 samples annually. Uh, the Texas districts, the responsibility there is uh, uh, going out and sampling QM project samples um, that are requested um, and then shipping those to the, uh, the, uh, the construction division. Uh, they're, in, they're also in, uh, responsible for the project level testing and the final acceptance of the aggregate. Um, and then also, as one thing, as we saw, there's a lot of going on in a quarry, so anytime district personnel or uh, division personnel actually goes into an, a quarry, it's important for safety reasons to sign in and out at the quarry so they know uh, what exactly is going on. And you're also <coughs> allowed to follow site specific safety procedures. Um, and here's your answer. Um, the San Antonio district is the district that has the most sources on the AQMP, and the Tyler district has the least. And the aggregate producers, the responsibilities there is, um, you know, notifying construction division of any changes in ownership and uh, maintaining current contact information, um, submitting the mining plan and quality control plan that we saw there uh, that uh, Harry showed as well as GPS data and requested doc documents that I'll get into in a little bit later. Um, the other, the mo probably the most important thing is the maintaining identification of stockpiles at the quarries at all times. Uh, this allows us to understand which stockpiles are designated for Texot at any given time, whether that's for a project or a QM. And that's um, uh, because they have, many, they have many customers, and so not all of it's going to Texot. So uh, here's another fun fact. The Agrius lab has also tested uh, over 450 sources since 2000. All right, another question for you also. Uh, how often are the Agrius MPL updated within a year? Some of these are easy questions, so just testing out where you guys are at. How many people know about the AQMP? Can I get a show of hands? Anybody read through it? Fall asleep? Now we got one, twice, three times, and then uh, a month. All right. So it looks like uh, twice, which is, that is the correct answer. Uh, these are the products, again, uh, the four products that we're dealing with and the five tests that we run um, for each of those products. Um, just to give you a quick synopsis of what tests we're doing for each of those different products. Uh, the AQMP also covers the surface aggregate classification, uh, and this is the criteria that you can find on, in Table 1 uh, of that document. Um, this just determines the stack for um, SAC A, SAC B, using the magnesium sulfate soundness, the minimum value or the maximum value of that uh, test 
as well as the minimum value of acid insoluble residue test. Uh, the crush phase count is, uh, you know, set at 85 there, but uh, it will still, for those, uh, where the crush phase count is required to be higher, um, uh, that is a project level test. All right, so how many um, project samples are necessary for the, the rate of values to be calculated for a source that's going to be put onto the HMP or is on the HMP? Three, we got five, three again. It's a race. Cinco. All right. We'll <laughs> we got six. All right. All right. I'm going to go with Cinco. Uh, the uh, let's see. These are the tests. So I'll get into the number of tests to develop the ratings in a little bit. Uh, but here we're going to go into each of the different tests. So LA abrasion is the first test. It's an impact and abrasion test. Um, here are the details, uh, but pictures do a much better job. So you have in the upper left, you have a sample. It's, you know, 5,000 grams. It's going to go into this mill. This is the LA abrasion machine. It ro rotates for 500 rotations. Um, and then you get this. At, on the uh, the right hand side, as this is the same sample, um, and so that that sample on the right is what you'll you'll sieve over number 12, and whatever is passing that is the loss. And these are the spec limits for LA abrasion. We have for LRA and dense graded uh, and concrete rock, we have a 40 percent um, loss. The seal coat and super pave at 35, and your performance uh, mixes at 30. Next test is going to be uh, the magnesium sulfate soundness. Um, so this is a uh, it's a durability test to test the mechanical properties of that of the aggregate uh, using a wetting and drying cycles of a magnesium sulfate solution. So it's going to go into uh, the solution for 16 to 18 hours, uh, and then it, after that it's going to drain, and then we're going to uh, dry it four to six hours until it costs a mass. And that's one cycle. It's a five cycle mass or a five cycle test. Um, and then after that last cycle or drying cycle, we're going to put it in a rinse tank with 110 degree water and until we get the samples completely free of salt. And then, uh, and then also the loss is determined by a normalized gradation specific to that product type. Uh, there are some constraints on the solution and the uh, for temperature and specific gravity uh, to make sure it's a, sta a stable solution. Uh, here's our environmental room to keep that solution stable. Uh, we keep it at a, a constant temperature, uh, which also keeps that specific gravity at a certain, at a constant. And in the middle there, we have um, the rinse tank um, that our shop builds built for us. Uh, they love us and we love them. Uh, stainless steel. It's, um, you know, reinforced. It's pretty long. It's probably, it's longer than this table here. Uh, it's pretty deep, uh, and we put, we can fill that 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 uh, that tank up because we have enough tanks and solution. But the idea is that water comes up through the top of that from the bottom, and then washes all that salt up. And there's that little uh, out out uh, drain at the top there on the on the upper right of that uh, container on the tank. So here's a. Uh, picture of like worst case scenario. Uh, this isn't your rock, uh, but so we have a, uh, that first in the upper left we have uh, a, f a first cycle uh, after the, um, after it's been in the wetting uh, cycle and then that kind of before it goes into the oven. And then after f the fifth cycle we're looking at um, in the, the, the picture next to it is the after it's been through the wetting cycle the fifth time. And then as you go down to the left, there's the rinse or the sample after the rinse. Uh, and then after the wet sieving and drying on the, in the bottom right. So you, this is kind of a, this is actually a caliche material. It's really soft. If you lick it, you will find out that it has porosity. And that is the whole point of licking. 
It's not for the taste. <laughs> anyway, um, this, here's the magnesium, the specifications, uh, limits for the magnesium sulfate soundness. Um, the LRA and the dense graded mix at 30, seal coat and super paved and microsurfacing at 25. There is an air on here. Um, the concrete coarse aggregate, is, if it has no air, is going to be at 25. And then if it does have air, it's going to be at 18 percent. Uh, and then your, perf your performance um, mix is at 20. Uh, the micro devolve test is an abrasion test. Um, there's no spec limit. We use this for a, a quality control test, both within the labs at the districts, and then also with the aggregate producers when they when we have concerns about their uh, the quality. Um, uh, basically, we're putting the steel spheres in there. We add the rock. We add some water. We let it soak, and then we put the cap and put the cap on it, uh, and then it rotates on these machines for 120. And, and whatever the timing is based on that gradation. Um, and then we determine the loss over stack sieves. Uh, the acid insoluble residue test is a, is a test that we, uh, we use, to, uh, which is hydrochloric acid uh, being added to a 25 gram sample. Uh, and we add that hydrochloric acid until that reaction is complete. And then we rinse that sample uh, with distilled or deionized water. Um, and then the spec limits for that is the, the fine aggregate for some concrete is a six is a 60 percent mi minimum, and then a, a sac A is for hot mix and seal coats at 55 percent. Uh, the last test I'm going to talk about is the coefficient of thermal expansion, um, and that's in concrete for the aggregate. Uh, it's using a standard mix design uh, as indicated in uh, text 428 to produce test cylinders which are cured 28 days before testing. And it goes through a three cycles of uh, temperature cycles from 50 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, continuous data collection to uh, determine what the microstrains are per degree F. Uh, currently the spec limit is 5.5 microstrains at, uh, per degree F. Uh, for item 360 only. Um, one special note, um, if a source has a rated value on the concrete rated source quality catalog, uh, there is um, no project level testing. Um, and this is the apparatus. I uh, just have one quick slide. I'm going to get over this. Um, I'm being asked to Q&A. So just this is a quick uh, synopsis of the AQMP process of the adding sources. Um, so if you're, if you're, this goes back to whether or not um, you you know or um, if the source is on the AQMP or not, it can still be used. Okay, uh, if it is not on the AQMP, it can be used, and that the whole point is to get those sources. Um, we like Texot likes competition, and it actually brings more in available to uh, two people uh, within the districts. Um, so what we have is if you already are supplying an aggregate product to a textile project, then we can, st we can begin the, the testing and approval process. If you're not, then we can run the informational sample. And we, d we do that for each of the uh, aggregate producers for, um, and then pr th at the same time they're providing uh, producer core information for that source. As they go through that testing and approval project sample, once it is getting on uh, a textile project, then we, we get a mining plan, we get the, um, and once we get the five samples, we develop the ratings and up, you know, update site manager, and then we notify everybody with the ratings, uh, aggregate producers and the districts included, uh, and then at that point we update the catalogs. Um, at that point, I'm going to stop. Time. Mm -hmm. So, aside from that, if you have any questions, thank you. No questions? Hey. I got a question, and I'll say it from here so I won't have to ask to, for you guys to repeat it. Um, more, more than a question, it's more of a comment. 
uh, we, I think in uh, Mr. Bush's uh, uh, presentation, he, he talked about geotechnical and uh, it gets very costly. Uh, one of the things that I, I like doing is geotechnical and, and I believe we cannot put a price on getting the, all the information we need to make the good sound decisions to build better roads. And I, I want to emphasize that a lot is geotechnical is very important to making pavement designs and bridge designs and so forth. So I want to thank Mr. Bush and Michael DeWitzig for their presentations. Can we give them a good round of applause?